Fifth Hour Radio Show. Kim, give us the lowdown on how you got involved with table tennis, and when did you first pick up a paddle? Well, let's see. The first time I picked up a paddle, I think, was when it rained and, and I was in school, in junior high school. I mean, we really didn't get introduced to table tennis at all in school, uh, just when it rained. And in California, that was very seldom. So if it rained, we, you know, roll out a table from some hidden shed and, you know, we got a chance to play. But that was really the only exposure that I got till I was about 14. And uh, actually, my father had a business partner who was a top senior player, and he had, my uh, dad had just bought my mom and I a ping pong table, and so when uh, my dad was talking to his business partner, he had, his friend had just come back from Sweden, where he competed the World Senior Championship, so my dad got real jazzed about it and thought, okay, you know, now we've got something for the kid to do, <laughs> so... They, they took me down to this uh, place called the Hollywood Table Tennis Club, and it was uh, it was like an upstairs warehouse in the, in the heart of Hollywood and uh, introduced me to the sport that way. So it was kind of late. You know, in other countries, they, they uh, wheeled the kids off very early. So I got a very late start. But I'd say about 14. That was when I first started paddling, so to say. So do you consider yourself someone who was just made for this sport? Was it natural ability or just a lot of hard practice? Uh, actually, a little bit of both. You know, I was always athletic as a kid growing up, just didn't know, you know, where I was going to end up. You know, I played all sports, but I found that table tennis was the most challenging, and it was an individual sport, too, so you could really work on it. But the thing with table tennis, the most challenging thing is that it really takes about 10,000 hours or 10 years to get really good. So that, that was the challenging aspect. And, and I think having really quick reflexes and good hand-eye coordination. I had great vision, too. And just as an all-around athlete, it, it was a good fit for me. And plus, in life, I've just got two speeds, faster and faster. So we were pretty much a perfect fit. So <laughs> you, you mentioned reflexes. Like, Don't you hold some kind of record for, like, the fastest reflexes of anybody in any sport as far as the Olympic Actually, Festival? Yeah, it was, it was back in 86 in Houston. You know, they used to have the U.S. Olympic Festival. It was actually sponsored by the Olympic Committee, and it was held every year that they didn't have the Olympics. So it was a great competition for us and for all sports. So it was all the Olympic sport athletes, but just in the United States. So this one year, it was in uh, Houston, Texas, and they had gathered a group of optometrists and ophthalmologists from all over the world to test all the athletes. So we just got, they basically just wanted to see why certain athletes excelled in certain sports, if vision had any part of it. And then, you know, you got tested, and if you needed glasses or contacts, they would take care of you. So it was just a myriad of tests, though, like two and a half hours of testing all these different rooms and with lights and color charts and beads and you name it. So they had this uh, one test that was at a podium, and you you know, have a green light and a red a red button and a green button with lights on and off. And so when you're ready, you press one of the buttons down. And then from, you know, it could happen right away or it could happen within 10, 15 seconds, the other light's going to go off. So you they test your reaction time to hitting that other light. And I guess I had broken several of the records during the course of the testing. So they had come around with their the doctor that was the CEO, I guess, of the whole program. And and he had uh, pulled me aside and said, you know, ESPN wanted to film one of the athletes that excelled, and, and I had broken some of the records, so they put me on tape with ESPN going around to, like, three of the tests. So at this reflex test at this podium, apparently I had tied the U.S. Olympic Festival record, which tested all of the athletes, all of the American athletes, and I think I set a point one six. And so they put me through that test and gave me three tries to see if I could improve it. And so the first, I got a point one eight, and then I tied it again with a point one six. And then the last one was really funny because I just kind of flinched right when the light went off and, and went with it and ended up getting a point one four. So I kind of lucked out. But the record has stood up, as far as we know, um, just uh, from some of the testing at other Olympics uh, or Olympics in um, Beijing, uh, Michael Phelps. His best reaction time was 0.64, so that's still a half second difference. Yeah, that's, so, that's yeah, an amazing it, it's record to hold. Time. Yeah, that's an amazing record to hold. At what point do you 
Did you really start competing competitively, though? Do you remember your first real tournament and, you know, how you fared then? Yeah, you know, it, it actually it was the first couple of years. I really didn't win very much. It, it was, a, 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 you know, mostly training that time. Um, so by the time I was 17, that's when I started coming on the scene. I had gone to Europe to do some training there. When I came back, I won the California State Championship, and I won the California Junior Championship. But that was kind of the start. I finally started getting the hang of the game and winning. And then from there, I just I used to train at the different Olympic training centers. And, you know, you get better. You train with the, the top table tennis players, and then you, you're in that group of elite athletes that you get to go to the different tournaments and travel and, and just compete with all the, the cream of the crop, so to say. Now, you've mentioned you've called it ping pong and you've called it table tennis. When did you get serious and started calling it table tennis instead of ping pong? <laughs> That's funny. You know, when I was much younger, it was a it, it was an issue. We didn't like for people to call it ping pong because it, cause we had fought so hard to get it into the Olympics in, in 1988, and we wanted to, it to be respected as a sport. So we, we really, you know, preferred that people call it table tennis. Now, at this point, it's a little bit different. You know, I, I played professionally. So whether it's called ping pong or table tennis, people still identify it as the same game or sport, and it really is. Yeah. But generally, ping pong is played in the basement. Table tennis is played in a stadium. That, that's ping the pong is played when it's raining outside at school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and then again, it depends who you're playing, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. So, so when you were training for the Olympic trials in 92, you had this accident, which at the time I assume you thought, you know, had ended your career. Uh, what happened exactly, and what kind of toll did that have on you mentally? It, it was it was a freak accident. You know, um, I had t- I finished in the top 10 at the 1988 trials and was so close, and so I figured, okay, I'm still, you know, still young. I'm going to dedicate the next four years. So it was before the Olympic trials in 92. I had just finished having dinner with a friend down in Santa Monica, and he was walking me to my car, I didn't realize the heel of my shoe had come off. It was like a flat dancing belly, not a high heel shoe. But enough of a heel, so just the spikes of the nails that hold the actual heel were sticking out. didn't know it. So as he's walking me across the street, there was like a slight gradation to a wheelchair kind of curve. And uh, I guess that just that little bit of a grade and those spikes sticking out of the shoe I just feet went overhead so fast in mid conversation, and the next thing you know, my right arm, my plane arm, landed on concrete, mm. and it shattered into fifteen pieces. I mean, it, it was nasty. It within ten seconds. I mean, my, when it first happened, my arm was an S, wow. and then within like ten seconds, they turned my arm over, and it was completely black from the elbow down. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was it was scary, and so and it was very painful and the third the first surgery that I had to have of course put lots of rods and bolts and pins and screws and plates in there and I had one what they call as a fixator so it's these posts that go through your skin and bone and hold everything together and I had to wear that for nine months Wow! so you yeah, just imagine it, it was a, a crucifixion so to say it was the most painful thing I ever was and then I went through several surgeries after that because they had severed the nerve when they put the fixator in. Mm-hmm. And after all, everything said and done, it was a few years of you know rehab and surgeries. I tried to play after the last surgery. They, they weren't able to reattach the nerve all the way, so they got it about a third attached. So I'm still numb on the top of my arm from the elbow down, but still have some movement in it. And it, it does, the wrist doesn't go all the way back, but I, you know, I've been able to use it. Yeah. So... I actually, you know, at, so this is about 98, I think, was the last surgery, late 97, early 98. And so after I recouped from that, I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. But so much time had gone by in our sport, you know, you can't take that kind of time off. And especially when you're at the top of your game and you've got a certain amount of time left, it just it doesn't work. So I, But I thought, well, let's just see. So I tried to play, and oh, gosh, Rob, it, it was so... Painful. Just if the ball hit me, it, it would have to drop the paddle and just forget about it. Wow! It just just if, the, if the if the table tennis ball hit you, it would hurt that. Yeah, way. if somebody had smashed the ball and it hit my arm and, and I missed the paddle, just that alone, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, if I can't even handle that, there's just no way. Yeah. So I, you know, I just realized at that point, okay, well, that, that's it. 
you know. So as painful as it was, I just kind of had to, you know, reinvent myself and move on with life, which is what I did for 18 years. So, so yeah, you, you're talking 18 years. You never picked up a paddle. What happened? I didn't. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's amazing, you know, because what I'm about to say is, you know, for 18 years, you didn't pick up a paddle. But what happened after all those years that reconnected you to the game? I mean, you're back to playing. Well, it's funny, you know, just goes to show you in life, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And so, well, what happened was, you know, after the recession, I had my own business. And um, you know, this is right in the beginning of the recession. I started losing some clients because it was affecting them. And I figured, you know, instead of, you know, trying to save the business, I think I'd rather sell it and, you know, just start get, get a job with, a, with you know, a, a larger company that pays your own insurance and everything. So I got a great job. And um, so this was almost well, about four and a half years ago. And I started working for this company called Dial 800. And a real up-and-coming company. They, they've been on the Inc. 5000 list three or four years straight now. And um, so I started working there. And, and you know, after, oh, I think it was in the first few months, the CEO announced that they had done really well that quarter and they wanted to, you know, uh, give the employees lifetime memberships to 24-hour fitness. And, I, you know, I hadn't exercised in so long. I'd been sedentary. And I, I thought, okay, well, now I've got no, no excuse. <laughs> So went to the gym, but it just uh, it was in a in a small building and the ventilation wasn't very good. So I, I went back to the studio. I said, you know, this really isn't for me. I and and so I gave him the card back. I thanked him, and he says, well, he was making a little joke, and and I said, well, well maybe you should take up ping pong again. You know, just to be a little sign. And did, you, and did you say to him, wait a minute, it's table tennis? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, did you but, still you know, have that, that drive was, in you where you said, look, it's table tennis? No, you know what? I didn't even have that. There was nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird that you mentioned that because, it, you know, after quitting for all those years, uh, even when I watched the Olympics and, and saw table tennis on TV, it was too painful to watch. I, I, I would have to turn the channel. I couldn't even watch it on TV. That's how that's how much it affected me. So. Yeah. When he made that comment, I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe it's good for maybe I can try it and at least play for exercise because I thought, you know, rather than going to the gym, I could do something that I really love to do, and now it doesn't have to be competitive. Let's just see if I can even play. Mm-hmm. So, so I went down, I found a club, and, and ironically, the club is called the Gilbert Table Tennis Center, and I'm like, well, that's kind of tailor-made. Yeah. <laughs> and they were on, <laughs> they were on Olympic Boulevard, and I'm like, gosh, I've been away from the sport too long. <laughs> <laughs> They've already named a center after you. And... <laughs> but I walked in, you know, in 2010 and just basically said, honey, I'm home. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, met some really great people down there and started to play. And let me tell you, I was more shocked than anybody else that I could actually play. And, I mean, I, I, was, I didn't it hurt, but nothing like it did before. It was more or less like an aching kind of pain. Mm-hmm. And I thought, Something well, you gosh, could work you know, through. this was going to be great exercise. Mm-hmm. So that's what I started doing. I, I got a coach. I got a really good coach, actually. And she started working with me. And uh, lo and behold, you know, I, I started getting invited to do certain things. And then, you know, Susan Sarandon had opened her spin franchise in New York and was bringing it to L.A. So I got invited to the uh, grand opening party where I met her and some of the other partners and some of the top players. And after that, I was actually given a hosting position. I was offered a hosting position like one night a week to host parties at, at the Mondrian Hotel, where it's been Hollywood was at the time. So that kind of rekindled things. And from there, oh my gosh, it's been, I have not rested since then. I thought, you know, well, this is going to be a great gig. It's not going to last forever. You know, I'm, 47, 46, 47, we'll see how it goes, but it just took off, and it got so trendy and so popular, and then I started competing in tournaments, and it just it, it just made a full circle. It's, this is all icing on the cake. Yeah, it seems like on. everything is starting to move, you know, like in fast forward for you. you, you you're picking up well, sponsorship, I, you know, exhibitions, and it seems to me like you picked up right where you left amazing. off. Since, since the Olympic trials, you know, I finished in the top 12 last year, 
which was a feat in itself because there was only two wild card spots and you had to be the finalist in the nationwide tournament and the U.S. Olympic trials just to get in. So I, I was a finalist in that, but that's how I got in. And it was back east in uh, or, uh, Cary, North Carolina. So while I was there, um, there was a, some kind of TV crew or movie crew that was there. They producers approached me and asked me if I wanted to be in their movie. And they were following the top players that were gearing up for the Olympics. And I, you know, sure. And they had a, a story because it's my age and the comeback and everything. So it just started to ramp up from there. And and I thought, okay, well, after the Olympic trials, it's going to slow down. It hasn't. I mean, oh my gosh, this summer has been amazing. I've I've been able to go to Fiji and got a bunch of sponsors for all the kids in the islands there, and we got tables and paddles and did exhibitions and tours over through all the islands. And then, um, geez, just like six weeks ago, headlined at Dodger Stadium with the LA Dodgers, and that was just amazing. Yeah, I was going so, to mention that you're you you're, you're teamed up with uh, Clayton Kershaw, right? Yeah, yeah. These guys are so great. They uh, Well, Clayton Kershaw, you know, a lot of baseball teams in the clubhouse have ping pong tables. Uh, baseball players have always played ping pong in their off season, especially during spring training where they're trained, you know, like three or four hours a day. The rest of the time they're playing ping pong in the clubhouse, I guarantee you. And it's not just the Dodgers. Now, see, that's <laughs> something so I didn't know. And I bet a lot of our listeners didn't know that either. There's a lot of other sports, like even after my show at Dodger Stadium, I got a tweet from uh, Christian Leitner from uh, the NBA, and now we're going to be doing a bunch of uh, some events with the NBA gearing up for November. So it's really popular with other sports, even with the NHL. Right after they won the Stanley Cup, we did an exhibition in Hollywood with some of the guys. So it's just it's just been amazing. It's gotten so popular. And the events that we do, you know, what's so great is that we're able to really expand and not just have it be a sport where it's actually entertaining people. We're raising money for fundraisers and charities. We do court, co- uh, corporate networking events like me- for media, cinema, music, um, fashion shows. I mean, you name it. It's, everybody's playing these days, it seems. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Randy. Randy's got some questions for you. He, he always asks oh, sure. kind of the off-the-beaten-path questions, so he's, he's chomping at the bit to talk to you. Okay, Randy. Hi. All right, let's, let's take our trek off the beaten path here. <laughs> okay. First of all, it's nice to meet you. I, 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 you too, Randy. i got to ask you, I mean, this, this sport is it's just intense. I mean, there's no lollygagging around in this. When you're, when you're walking up to the table, you got your paddle in your hand, your headband on, before you get to the tournament, the table, to do your thing, what kind of hype music do you listen to? What pumps you up? Oh, hip hop completely. You, I I like to take my mind completely as far away from the game. And for me, anything that makes me want to get up and dance, that's what I'm listening to because it just gets your blood pumping. And it gets like when you start dancing, you're in a relaxed state. And if you do that before you play, then all that adrenaline gets put to the right place. Hmm. Well, you were talking about island exhibitions a while ago. Uh, do you have any trick shots that you do in your exhibitions? Actually, I've got one that's been doing really well in our live shows. It's an under-the-leg smash. That Actually, I beat Clayton Kershaw on that shot <laughs> at the prodding of Brian Wilson and Scott Van Slake and Yasiel Puig behind me yelling, kill him, kill him. <laughs> how, how did you come up with that? You know, I just, I think I just started doing it as, I I didn't start smashing at first. You know, people tried trick shots. I had tried the the behind-the-back shot, but that was a little bit more stressful on the shoulder because you really have to turn your, my my body just didn't go that way. (laughs) But, so I tried to do the the under-the-leg one, and I wasn't able, I I don't just pat the ball. I like to smash it. It's just automatically what I do. So (laughs) I've developed an an under-the-leg smash that is deadly. (laughs) <laughs> uh, speaking of deadly and smashing, have you ever hit the ball so hard that it hurt the other dude or, or dudette on the other side? Yeah, and I paid, ah, uh, yes, and I did it recently, and I paid the price for it. I, it was at Dodger Stadium. I was playing, we did uh, uh, some celebrity matches, and I was playing with Scott Van Slyke against Brian Wilson and Squeak, 
And I smashed the ball into Brian Wilson's stomach, and I guess I hit it pretty hard because he gave me the scariest look with that black beard, and I was just like, oh, crap, here we go. I'm and gonna... sure enough, he, and he, he was like taking his two fingers and pointing them at me and putting them back in his eyes and pointing them at me, and I'm like, oh, dude, he's after me now. <laughs> and sure enough, with the, and a couple of rallies later, uh, Van Slyke had kind of uh, returned the ball that was a little bit too high, and Brian came in, and he killed it so hard, and he got me right back in the same spot in the stomach that I got him. <laughs> and, yeah, Revenge. he was a little excited about that. Revenge. Those guys can play, too. They can, they know how to play. Oh, um, what are you talking about smashing? So what kind of grip do you keep on that paddle? I mean, have you ever went to smash something and be like, oh, my hands are wet, zoop, and then send the paddle flying or anything? You know, you have to be careful. You learn that in your training that you, you have to keep your grip. I play a shake hand grip, mm -hmm. like you're shaking somebody's hand. You kind of have to keep your grip loose enough so that you have flexibility with your shots and your strokes and your wrist. But it has to be firm enough so that when you do loop, you don't lose the paddle. So, yeah, it, I like to play shake hand just because I have the versatility of either backhand or forehand smash. With the Asian gripper, what is called the pen hold grip, not very many players use that anymore. It was it was used a lot, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, but it really limits the back end. That's why the Chinese had such great footwork and such great forehand because they were trying to protect that limited back end. Mm. So that's why I've always stayed with the uh, shake hand grip. I tried the pen hold grip, but it just wasn't for me. Now, has, has, the, has the game altered a lot over the years where some things are lost, like what you were talking about? Yeah, it ha well, um, it, I, I can't say that it's altered so much while I've been playing because the, the big changes were before I started and, and while I had uh, retired, quote-unquote. <laughs> um, it's basically the, the, the rubber is inverted so that the, the smooth part is on the outside and it's very sticky. So the, the manufacturers are trying to create better and faster and spinnier rubber all the time. And now we all have a, the, the, there's a special glue that you use between the wood and the rubber. And that, that has been regulated now, whereas before, like, we, could, we used to go to Germany and get this bicycle glue that was extra spinny and bouncy, and now they've outlawed that. So everybody has to use the same glue, the same amount, and it's measured with these computers and everything. So it's much more high-tech now than it, than it used to be. And now they've changed the ball completely. Mm. Um, it's like if next year we have to use a, a different, completely different kind of ball, a plastic ball that doesn't have gas on the inside. Ooh, it's probably SF6, I bet. I'm sorry? Sulfur hexafluoride. Right, right. Well, uh, <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the gas that's inside the ball, Randy? It very possibly could be. It's also used in electrical work. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if you if you put a flame to a ball, it'll turn to dust and it'll blow up and, and uh, it'll light up. <laughs> Speaking of lighting up, have you ever used a glow in the dark ball? No, I haven't. But I've gone to um, I, I've done some shows that have glow in the dark wear. But the, the usually when they use the light and the lights turn the the white ball to glow in the dark. Well, I guess that's all of the off the beaten path questions. Well, right? <laughs> well I could say I will. I could I could sit and ask you, you things like what's your what's your favorite okay. show? What's your favorite television show? Oh, are you kidding? Big Bang Theory. Really? <laughs> oh, awesome. huge Big Bang Theory fan. And I didn't start watching it in, in until it was like the third season that it was out. And, and yeah, I, I'm completely hooked. And they all play ping pong, too. Yeah, do you think Sheldon and Amy's going to have coitus this year? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that might have to be a, a um, series finale and not a season <laughs> finale. <laughs> well, I'm excited. I'm a big... I'm a, I'm a big uh, Walking Dead fan, and I know they, they it premieres tonight. It's actually going on right now, so I'm going to set, oh, I'm setting my DVR. Okay, yeah, that. and you're on on your side of the country, maybe not over here. Right now, we're watching Dallas and and the Redskins play. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me let me just ask you: Could you have ever imagined, from when you first picked up that paddle as a little girl, that you know it would have taken you on the journey that it has so far in your life? No, you know it's been it's been quite a ride. I've been to since I started this. Uh, I've been to about 130 some odd countries, 
And it's just, it's allowed me to see the world. It's allowed me to meet some amazing people that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet. Um, and just to have this second go around, it, it's just really, it, it, it's fulfilling. That's all I can say. And, and just the fact that we're able to make such a big difference. It, you know, I love working with kids and, and giving back. And that's what I do every every summer. I donate my vacation and we go to a different country each time to try and help table tennis in other countries. And just in uh, when I was in San Francisco, like a week and a half ago, we did an event with MC Hammer um, for Chip Bay Area Schools. Just in one night, I mean, there was, I'm telling you, there was 900 people at this event. We raised six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in one night. Wow, for that's amazing. Bay Area Schools. Yeah, I mean, these events are so popular, and now we've partnered up with a lot of the different companies that do the software for running the tournaments at these events and. And so we're going to have a lot of things coming up. I really partnered up with uh, Su Young Lee, who's a supermodel and actress. She's on, uh, well, she was on Entourage, and she's uh, just finished a, uh, a, 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 what was it? She did a, an appearance on the Kardashian show where she coached Bruce Jenner's son, Brandon Jenner, in one of the uh, shows. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so that's we've a got a lot of popularity. I'm sorry? I said that's a, that's a huge show. Oh yeah, no, she's uh, she's definitely in the limelight for on the media side, and she's actually recently um, was the first table tennis athlete sponsored by Adidas. So mm. she and I have uh, partnered up, and we're going to be putting on a whole bunch of events together. So before we get off here, let everybody know about your website, social media, stuff like that. They can go to and uh, check out what you got going on. Sure, sure. You can go to kimgilbert.com. And that's got all the events posted. There's going to be a whole slew of events coming out. And we've got the movie, Top Spin movie, coming out in February. So that's the best place. And then if anybody wants to follow us on Facebook, the links are provided there on the website. So that's the best place to go to. And especially for companies that want to do you know, networking events for their clients and prospects, we, that's what we specialize in as well. So there's a, there's a whole media kit there that the uh, you know people can take a look at if they want to have us for an event or a private party or, or what have you. Well, Kim, thank you very much for taking time out tonight and joining us on the show. Oh, thank you so much for asking me. It was a true pleasure. Radio Show. Show.